In the decade of big hair, bigger egos, and network primetime television, the 1980s saw a wonderful collection of TV shows and unique vehicles that still wow many even to this day. Ranging from the sleek and sexy to the down and dirty, each one aiming to earn the number one spot the ratings will. MFP presents 10 TV car shows of the 80s. Thelma Bulpit. I've told you a thousand times, it's not a car, it's a Kingswood. An oddity on this list, Australia's answer to Archie Bunker and All in the Family, Kingswood Country is one of the few TV shows to be named after a popular existing car brand model and one man's obsession with his beloved machine, where his prized possession would be mentioned in almost every episode, yet ironically was never shown on screen. Give me your keys. The Kingswood? You're not taking the Kingswood? I just missed a sheen the roof rack. <laughs> A much-loved comedy of its time, where its political incorrectness would give married children and Al Bunny's Dodge slash Plymouth Duster a run for its money. Kingswood Country focused on the life of a middle-aged Aussie man, living in a suburban home with his somewhat ditzy wife, and dealing with his everyday hatred of nuns and his son-in-law, and always at odds with his Datsun salesman brother, and his sexually rampant son, who constantly wants to borrow his famed Kingswood to go out on dates. He's a traitor to the Anzac religion. What'd he do, drink sake in an RSL club? <laughs> Worse, he became a Datsun dealer. <laughs> Lasting six seasons where the lead character of Ted Bullpid played by Aussie legend Ross Higgins, would exaggerate the value of his true love, a Holden Kingswood which at the time was part of the big two competitive rivalries of Holden and Ford in supremacy of the Australian automotive market. The Kingswood name was a blanketed title for Holden, as much as Falcon was to Ford, which covered a different array of model stylings. The car in question, however, which had been in production from 1968 to 1984, would cease production while the show was still in its popularity, and Ted would eventually trade in his for a Holden Commodore. It was not long after this change that the show was eventually cancelled, ending suddenly in 1984. Making a return to TV again in 1997 in the short-lived sequel series simply titled Bullpit, The Kingswood would once again become a focal point, along with the show's catchy and memorable theme score as well. With no full confirmation of what exact make or motor Ted's Kingswood was, his dedication to keeping it safe and preserved is a testament to all car lovers across the globe. Hey, mother of God! He's dropped it on the Kingswood! <laughs> Inspired by the then not as popular 1982 Disney sci-fi sleeper hit, Tron, Automan was producer Glenn A. Larson's further dive into trying to replicate a recent hit of another futuristic style of teaming up of Man and Machine series. Lasting only one season, mostly due to its high budget, Automan jumped onto the popularity of introducing European sports cars and the new leap into the home computer craze. The show's premise was that of the creation of a computer-generated crime-fighting sentient being in the form of the show's title name. The character of Automan, played by Chuck Wagner, developed in a police crime lab by a young scientist, is able to create and demand at will any vehicle he sees fit for his needs to track down and capture criminals. Although having an array of different vehicles to choose from, be it a helicopter, a motorcycle, and even a tank and special jet, it was the black with blue glow outline LP400 Lamborghini Countach which was the most popular of choices for the show's main character. Released in 1974 to rival the Ferrari for sports car dominance, the Lamborghini Countach would become the go-to poster car in the 1980s, as it was seen on many walls alongside the Ferrari 308. Pricing in at $52,000 new, and equipped with a 3.9 litre V12 producing 375 brake horsepower, the LP400 Countach is still fondly remembered even to this day, and despite it being the design of 70s engineering, it was the 1980s that cemented its place in pop culture. Using reflective 3M material with slight colour alterations in post-production, one of the biggest standout of the appearance of the show was the blue, almost lightsaber-like outline wireframe image of the vehicles and Countach, the later of which actually belonged to famed TV producer Glenn A. Larson, who had become somewhat of a staple of action and car series in the 1980s, as several of his most popular TV shows which he wrote the premise for have made it onto this list and many others. Not reaching the same fame as other shows of its time, Automan remains as an interesting attempt at trying to capitalize on a decade which had its sights set into the future of science and beyond, and is a reflection of the melding of man and machine to coexist as one. Man, do you have a set of wheels? Get in! Unlike a previous entry on this list, the title vehicle of this show featured promptly and was a center point to the story. Featuring a gloss black 1965 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray C2 as the main car of choice, which although not fully confirmed within the show, came with five engine options when released, with the largest being a 427 7.0 liter L89 big block V8, which was said to have an output of around 435 brake horsepower. 
Using his ride as a type of code to get in contact with people who needed help via a newspaper advert that reads 65 Black Stingray for barter only to the right party. The character of Ray, played by Nick Mancuso, takes on a role of gun for hire, where his motivation, though not fully confirmed the reason why, trades his service on a favor for a favor basis, yet the protagonist is shrouded by mystery and his true identity and motives are never fully revealed within the show. An appealing aspect of the show was in its opening credits, where its style and presentation would go on to win a Primetime Emmy Award in 1986 for outstanding graphic and title design. Said to be an almost copy of another TV series of that decade, as the show was dubbed by some The Equalizer on Wheels, Stingray was less mainstream or as remembered as some of the other TV shows on this list, and again short-lived as it only ran between 1985 to 1987 for two seasons. Originally produced in California, come the second season the show's production would be moved to Canada and it was felt this change of location had cost the show its original appeal, yet it was still fondly remembered by fans who see it as a forgotten gem. Stingray was released during a time where competition for ratings was at its peak and the idea of a lone hero driving around in a high-powered machine offering his services was losing some of its initial appeal as the end of the decade closed in. As time has gone on, and although being a product of its era, Stingray still holds great appeal for its fans and is a show worth a second look as its entertainment value and its lead make up for any shortcomings the show may have suffered from critics when it was first released and can now be seen for what it was always intended to be. Coming off the success of The Six Million Dollar Man, Lee Majors was brought in for a new kind of series that focused on the life of a stuntman in a show that got its green light based on the strength of its theme song alone. When producer-writer Glenn Larson had first heard the song, The Ballad of the Unknown Stuntman, he decided it would make for a television series he knew would be a hit. The show followed the life of a stuntman turned bounty hunter Colt Seavers, who along with his partner Howie Munson would mostly be seen hunting down criminals in a modified 1982 GMC K2500 offered to production by General Motors. One of the demands of the show, which had taken the then popular trope of seeing the lead car jump over an array of different objects as seen in the late 70s TV, several GMCs were used and destroyed early on into production. This proved to be an issue that needed to be countered as there was going to be a challenge of meeting the demand of replacing the K2500 after each stunt if it could not endure the sudden impact of jumping and landing constantly. Eventually the crew had decided to alter the truck so as to reinforce the suspension and chassis and place the engine further behind center as to allow for the truck to land more comfortably without total breakage. The show had become a hit and made it to the top 10 spot of its time as it had lasted from 1981 to 1986, reflecting the appeal of the more everyman attitude of major stuntman turned bounty hunter character, not to mention 1986 icon Heather Thomas and her on-screen presence as Seaver's stunt prodigy Jody Banks who had also become a major fan favourite and was the other half of the Battle of the Heathers duel between herself and 80s TV siren Heather Locklear. The two turn brown 4x4 GMC Sierra Grande wideside with its lifted suspension and 350 cubic inch small block V8 engine was the perfect teaming for the show's characters and lead due to their rough around the edges style which Majors, who had been a co-producer of the show, was looking to take on to help try and give some distance to his hugely popular previous role as Steve Austin as to avoid being typecast. As per its premise, the show was littered throughout with a variety of stunts, crashes and jumps and had given the audience a behind the scenes look into the making of a Hollywood production and the career of a stuntman and just how exciting on its own the life of action and car chases could actually be in a time where what you saw on screen was almost always what you got. Two for one with the flash car and perhaps an even flashier van, the A-Team which was first released as with most shows on this list early into the 1980s had given audience a number of memorable icons, one of which being Mr. T's character of B.A. Baracus along with his beloved Vendura. Produced from 1983 to 1987, the A-Team was the story of a crack commando unit on the run from the military after escaping the law for a crime they didn't commit. As such the team would travel from place to place as mercenaries, offering their services to those who can find them for help. Originally introduced seen driving around a 1983 GMC Vendura in a black and grey with red trim colour scheme, the van with its grey leather interior and 350 cubic inch V8 engine had become an almost mobile command unit for the group, who despite wanting to remain inconspicuous, had no issue in travelling in a vehicle which stood out like a sore thumb. Being the prized possession of Baracus, the van would be seen as another character itself in the show. It would however be teamed up in Season 2 with the 1984 Corvette C4, also carrying a 350 cubic inch V8 with 230 horsepower, which at the time in the American automotive world was quite impressive given the emission restrictions in the 80s. Also continuing on with the red trim motif, the Corvette had a base white paint scheme and was the property of Dirk Benedict's face man, 
and would be seen used for the more speedy scenes of the show. Causing the career of Mr. T to go into the stratosphere due to his character's popularity, leading to him having his own cartoon series, the A-Team would become a popular staple in 80s action TV, so much so that in 2010, a Hollywood movie was made and the classic van would make a welcome comeback. Though brief in its appearance in the movie, the van is still one of the more recognizable inclusions on this list when it comes to 80s TV vehicles, and is almost as iconic as Mr. T himself when the decadent show is thought of during that era. Ooh, if you don't drop this crazy space rap, I'ma drop you for good! A made-for-TV pilot called Rolling Thunder that would later become a series, Hardcastle McCormack aired from 1983 to 1986. A unique pairing. The premise of the show is that of a newly retired judge who decides to go after a list of criminals who escape conviction during his tenure as he recruits the services of a young driver and his one-of-a-kind car that was created by his dead friend which he decides to steal and as a reward for his services is allowed to keep this pursuit vehicle named the Coyote X. Said to be a prototype racing car developed by his friend Johnny Flip Johnson, the Cody Coyote X would eventually fall into the hands of car thief Mark Skids McCormick, played by Daniel Hugh Kelly, as he and actor Brian Keith would spend their time putting the car's light body weight and low clearance to good use on the streets of Los Angeles. Starting out as a Manta Montage kit car, which was based on the McLaren M6 GT, the Coyote X was modified by Mike Fennell and Unique Movie Cars into the Red Street Speeder it would later be remembered as. The Manta Montage was powered by a Porsche 914 engine, with a horsepower output of 110. Come the end of the show in Season 2 and Season 3, the original Coyote would be replaced by a heavily modified DeLorean DMC-12, as the meter was proving an issue for cars to constantly get in and out of due to its awkward side openings in confined space. With the original Manta now in private hands, the stunt car which was used throughout the Season 3 run of the show was obtained and modified for the 1991 feature-length made-for-television movie Knight Rider 2000, where its shell would be modified to resemble that of a Pontiac Banshee 4. Eventually the car would find its way to a collector, who converted the Knight Rider 2000 car back into the Coyote X it originally started as, and is now said to also be in private collection. The show still retains a cult following, and the Coyote X is a much loved inclusion for a number of TV and movie car enthusiasts, who keep the show's legacy still alive to this day. One of the most 80s shows to be released in the 80s, Perhaps no other program had more influence on fashion of the time and has become almost the reference go-to and the idea of the 1980s is brought up in modern media. Miami Vice was littered throughout with style and excess, which was reflective of its choice of vehicles as well. Having originally started off with a Ferrari Daytona, the character of Sonny Crockett, played by Don Johnson, was shown to be a man of taste as he and his partner Rico Tubbs were seen cruising along the streets of Miami in a dark green Ferrari Spider, which turned out to be more trouble than it was worth for the production as an original 1972 Ferrari 365 GTS 4 Daytona was not obtained, and faux ones built on Corvette C3 chassis were used instead. Lasting only two seasons in this mode of transport, the show had fallen under fire once its popularity grew and had faced a potential lawsuit by none other than Ferrari itself due to this knockoff standing in place of the real deal. An agreement was made where the sports car company offered to replace the replicas with two brand new genuine white 1986 Ferrari Testarossas with a 4.9 litre flat 12 engine which produced an output of 380 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 in just 5.2 seconds, and a top speed of 180 miles per hour. The Testarossa would become the new image of Ferrari in the 80s, after the GTS 3 08 and 28, and would go on to feature in other pop cultural media throughout the remainder of the decade, including the hugely popular of the time Outrun arcade game. Part of the agreement for this new Ferrari came that the pretender to the throne was to be seen destroyed on screen, and come season 3 episode 1 an iconic meme was born, where with one test and a legal arms deal, the well-made and to many fan-favorite Daytona was no more and was exploded in an amazing piece of celluloid history. Yet it was later revealed that at least one was spared demolition, and after appearing in the John Candy film Speed Zone slash Cannonball Fever, the Daytona C3 was found abandoned and then restored and is now said to be in private hands. The show's success would continue throughout the world long after its ending and is now remembered as a reflection of a time in the 80s where high fashion and the idea of nothing exceeds greater than excess was in full swing and the case of life imitating art was never more fitting than with the creation of this show. So. Guns don't work on Sunday. With the new decade came a new era of style and hero. Replaced was the gritty hard-nosed detectives and street cops of the 1970s who would be seen driving around in some Detroit muscle or other beat up types of vehicle, and in came a new form of action star. 
With the release of 1980's Magnum P.I. with Tom Selleck in the lead role of Vietnam vet turned private investigator Thomas Magnum, living the life of luxury in Hawaii thanks to the generosity of wealthy novelist Robin Masters, who allows Magnum to operate from his guest villa and also allowed him the use of one of his prized possessions, a red 1979 Ferrari 308 GTS, later changing model years to 1981 and 1984 GTSIs. In the era of the 80s, more and more European sports cars would take place on our TV screens and on our walls, as the image of either Ferrari or Lamborghini seen to have at one time or another found its way in many bedroom and garages during that decade. The image of Tom Selleck and the world showcased within the opening credits Ferrari became a popular part of primetime television for many who tuned in to watch the long-running show. Given the show's choice of styling demands, and the fact that actor Selleck, who stood at 6'4", was not able to fit comfortably in most European cars of the time, at one point, the producers originally wanted the main car of choice to be a Porsche, yet the motor company refused to make modifications needed to allow the actor to sit according to the camera needs within one. The Italian sports machine was brought in, and the character of Magnum would most often be seen cruising along the coast of the tropical territory, with the roof removed and hair flowing along the island roads. Solving cases and forever getting into disagreements with Masters Estate caretaker Jonathan Higgins, who was not fond of Magnum's constant use of the Ferrari, as a number of situations led to the car being destroyed or stolen several times throughout the show's run in eight seasons, which ended in 1988. The teaming of man and machine proved to be a hit combination for the show. Obtaining five cars per season to be used, the Ferrari GTS 308 with its 3 liter V8 255 horsepower engine and its 6.5 second 0 to 60 time, along with a top speed of 150 miles per hour, was always a treat to see on the small screen, as several of the 308s used within the show have fetched nearly double what a non screen used Ferrari GTS 308 can bring on its own. Proving the impact this one of a kind series had, and the popularity of hearing the theme song in the car speed off and enjoying a show that left its mark on the TV screen. Very few cars can lay claim to having their own fan mail and song performed by a famous singer made for them due to their popularity. Yet one 1969 Dodge Charger RT can make such a claim and then some. Released at the tail end of the 1970s, The Dukes of Hazard would be a show whose family friendly styling, action car chases and obvious sex appeal in its cast proved to be a smash hit. Focusing on light hearted hijinks with amazing car stunts, mostly consisting of a muscle car named the General Lee seen jumping over anything thrown in its path. The show's main premise was that of a southern family of cousins and their uncle Jesse, who would often find themselves the target of the local sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane and the town of Hazard's greedy mayor Boss Hogg schemes to put them behind bars or cheat the locals out of money. With stars John Schneider, Tom Wapat and Catherine Bark as the main leads playing cousins Bo Luke and Daisy Duke, the latter of which would go on to spawn a whole new fashion trend named after her in a short shorts called the Daisy Dukes. The other star of the show turned out to be, as mentioned, the second generation 1969 Dodge Charger RT in an orange slash red color scheme depending on sources, named the General Lee given the show's southern roots, which was equipped with an all too familiar 375 horsepower 440 Magnum V8 engine, which was a car seen as part of the last era of the golden age of the American muscle car scene in the 1960s. Not as complicated in its premise as a number of the other shows on this list, what had drawn the appeal to many who fondly watched the Dukes of Hazzard was in the fun that was shown to be had and encouraged, along with its car chases and amazing stunts, that would see this classic American car fly through the air, which led to influencing many other shows that followed in the years to come with the start of the new decade. Though later becoming the target of controversy in recent years due to its choice of flags sprouted on its roof at the time, again representing the show's southern roots, the General Lee was a much loved sight for all to see where over 300 Dodge Chargers were obtained and destroyed due to the constant need to see it jump, where the car was almost always demolished upon impact. The show's popularity would even go on to produce an animated TV series as well, and in the decades that followed, The Dukes of Hazard has gone on to represent a much different time on network television and in history itself, where this sense of fun was one of the key components to a lot of these shows of the 80s, in a decade where even the simplest of premises was a welcome one. As a famous movie once stated, Personality goes a long way, and unlike all the vehicles shown on this list, nothing could be more true than that of the Night Industries 2000, or Kit for short, in the form of a black 1982 Pontiac Trans Am. Coming off a string of interest in the stun-heavy shows such as Dukes of Hazard and The Fall Guy, or the Private Investigator series such as Magnum P.I., along with post-Star Wars sci-fi interest, Knight Rider was a show that seemed to arrive at the perfect time in television history, where the idea was explored that one man could make a difference, as long as he was equipped with a state-of-the-art steed. Being the creation once again by the all too familiar Glenn Larson, the idea was formed to have a series which showcased a futuristic car that could do almost anything simply by the push of a button, teamed up with a left for dead police officer named Michael Long, later to be given the new identity of Michael Knight, 
played to 80s Chiefs perfection by David Hasselhoff himself, and giving the one-of-a-kind AI vehicle its voice was Primus the Feeny character actor William Daniels, who until the party for the show after the first season had wrapped, neither actor had met one another or communicated on screen together. With the new generation Trans Am offered by Pontiac, cars number 1, 2 and 3 rolled off the assembly line and were given to the production, who brought in known car modifier John Ward to work on the vehicles, along with Michael Chaffee, who would later go on to work on the 1985 Back to the Future DeLorean time machine. Once the car and pilot were completed, on September 26, 1982, the sleek black beauty rolled onto our screens which changed TV and movie cars forever and gave NBC a hit television series. With a base Chevy V8 305 cubic inch engine with only 145 horsepower available thanks to the still ongoing emissions regulations, the 1982 Pontiac Trans Am had caught the appeal of a car out of time as its incarnation as the Night Industries 2000 would be seen travelling in speeds excess of 300 miles per hour, able to crash through walls and thanks to a turbo boost button, jump almost any obstacle in its path, including leaping from building to building. Even to this day, there are many Knight Rider fan clubs across the globe who have replicated Kit to perfection due to the impact the show had on them growing up. Lasting only four seasons, the show would try its best to keep its popularity going, but eventually dropped in ratings and was cancelled due to its high production budget, yet its influence continued with several follow-up TV shows and made-for-TV movies, along with a potential film often brought up as being in the works. Most of these follow-ups proved to unfortunately not capture the same magic the original show did, where even today, its 80s iconic status still seems to be part of modern day media and pop culture 40 years after its initial release, and its status as one of the best TV car series ever shows no sign of slowing down anytime soon. Michael Knight, a lone crusader in a dangerous world, the world of the Knight Rider. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like, subscribe and bell icon in order to help this channel grow and to bring you more content like this one, as your support is what keeps this channel going.